Welcome to The Spark, stories to change our times. My name is Wendy Marshall, and I'll be your host for today's show. In the last 40 years, growing wage and income inequality has resulted in unprecedented suffering for working people. Wages have stagnated, there are fewer jobs, and those who have jobs work twice as hard. Public institutions that once ensured the well-being of communities, like libraries, schools, fire stations, hospitals, are being turned over to private industry or closed altogether. Today, the wealthiest 1% controls 40% of the nation's wealth, while the bottom 80% possesses only 7%. And according to Fight for 15, it would take a typical fast food worker working 24 seven, 777 years to make as much as the CEO of McDonald's made last year. Our show today brings together a day laborer, a taxi driver, a fast food worker, all of whom are organizing for rights in industries where there is limited or no protection against exploitative labor practices. They are also workers in the fastest growing sectors of industry. These jobs are mostly low wage, informal, and temporary. So the central question for our show is, when the majority of jobs today pay wages that barely allow survival, how are workers in these sectors reimagining and reinvigorating a labor movement that can secure human rights for all? Our guests today are Mamadou Kante, a day laborer and member of the Philadelphia Workers Association, Ron Blunt, president of the United Taxi Workers Alliance, and Crystal Lopez, fast food worker and member of Fight for 15. Welcome you all. We're really excited to have you on the show today, especially since rarely on TV do we get to hear from the workers that make this country run. So I'm just, I'm wondering if you would just tell me a little bit about who you are, what's important to you, um, and what motivates you as somebody who's, who's working with Fight for 15. Okay, well I work at Dunkin Donuts Baskin Robbins, which is like two jobs in one, uh, 7.45 an hour, um, only for two years. I asked for a raise, and well, I was started at 7.25. I asked for a raise, and all I got was 7.45. So it was like uh, 20 cents more, which I was expecting a little bit more. It's really difficult. Uh, I, as I, I live with my mother. She's a single mother, uh, three kids, me and my two brothers. But uh, I have it's my responsibility right now to take care of my mother and my little baby brother because she has chronic vein disease. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I recently found out she might have something extra. Mm -hmm. So it's really difficult for them to find it, something very rare that she has, that she cannot uh, not work at all. Mm -hmm. um, her legs swell up, so it's really difficult and it's very stressful for her. So it's my job to at least make her feel like it's okay. As I tell her, you took care of us, now it's our turn to take care of you. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's that's my you know responsibility and my little brother if he needs something or if my mother can't be able to give it to him i'll be able to give it to him um and what i do there is uh i'm a cashier um i also clean i stock up um i also do basket side which is also ice cream mm -hmm. which is not an easy job as people think it is it's just scooping ice cream it's not that it's making sure everything's clean and stocked up, make sure the ice cream's there, and it's really hard. It's not easy, mm -hmm. and the thing is, I, I'm here to 515 because people may think that we're low lives because we work at fast food, no. We all have, um, we all have lives, mm -hmm. as just as anybody. Um, there's not only children, it's also parents working. There's people that I work with that also has children and has to survive to try to feed their kids, have clothes on their backs, have a shelter, and it's really difficult with 7.45 an hour. How about you, Ron? Tell us a little bit about who you are, what motivates you, what's important to you. Like, I started driving a taxi cab in 1983, um, and what inspired me to get into this work was um, the mistreatment of taxi drivers. Um, there was five taxi drivers killed in a 12-month period. At that time, taxi drivers hadn't had a meter, meter increase in 14 years. And just the way that um, the bosses, when I mean bosses, I mean the taxi regulator, the taxi owners, even the customers, police, everyone was bossing these, the taxi drivers around. And we felt that like, maybe if we organized that, that things might be different. Mamadou, would you also tell us about what motivates you to fight, what motivates you to, to organize with day laborers and some of the things that are important to you? Quand je suis venu à Philadelphia, je n'avais pas mes papiers en, en correct. 
Donc, euh, j'ai cherché du travail. On m'a dit d'aller à Home Depot. C'est Home Depot qui est à Nautix, Philadelphia. Donc, quand je suis parti, le premier jour que j'ai travaillé, c'était bon. Le deuxième jour, la police est venue. Ils veulent que tout le monde n'a qu'à quitter. Et je n'ai pas compris pourquoi on doit quitter. Ils disent que non, tu dois quitter parce qu'on ne veut pas que vous restez ici pour chercher du travail. J'ai dit, mais comment, où, on, où on peut aller pour aller chercher du travail Et le policier ne m'a pas, pas donné de temps et il a commencé à, à me taper dans la bouche et il m'a arrêté. C'était le 13 octobre euh, 1980, euh, l'an 2009 et il m'a envoyé à la, en prison. J'ai fait 19 mois en prison. J'ai fait 12 mois dans la prison de, 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 de Philadelphia. Après l'immigration, ils sont venus me prendre. Je suis allé faire 7 mois aussi à la prison d'immigration. Quand je suis sorti en l'an 2011, c'était en mai, je suis reparti à Home Depot vers le, le juin euh, l'an 2011. C'était le même problème. On a eu des organisations qui appellent MMP. Donc, euh, ils se sont associés avec nous. On va parler aux propriétaires du Home Depot, essayer d'arranger le problème. Et on ne nous a jamais laissé rester là-bas. Toujours, la police vient, ils veulent qu'on n'a qu'à partir. J'ai dit à mes amis, il faut qu'on soit ensemble, il faut qu'on s'attrape. Parce qu'une seule personne ne peut pas faire ce palabre-là. Il faut que nous tous, on vient ensemble. On fait ce palabre comme parce que l'union fait la force. As Mamadou was saying, like when he went to jail and then he came back, he still had to face that same police force. We fight because if we don't fight, things are never going to change. I mean, we have to keep standing up. We have to walk through our fear, you know, whether it's the police, whether it's police dogs or whatever it is, we have to stand up and fight, you know, for things to change. Your stories are a powerful reminder that behind each of us are children, parents, friends, and communities that we're working for. Now let's talk about some of the ways that your labor is exploited. To start that conversation, let's go to a clip of an interview with Alex Friedman, taxi medallion owner, who expressed his views about his company's growth and the role of workers in the taxi industry. This organization became a uh, supermarket for the taxi cab industry in Philadelphia. Those that are registered into my name are only 12 medallions out of 1,600. My family, my friends, my, our so-called con constituency, uh, we operate uh, about 350, 400 medallions. This is a free country. Anybody can do whatever he desires. We are not dictating anything to other individuals. Somehow, somehow, our constituency is growing. So. Probably those people who come to us have a bad experience somewhere else. So all of this evolved uh, from driving taxi cabs, operating taxi cabs, purchasing medallions, uh, financing medallions, bringing financial institution, become an insurance broker, a medallion broker, and eventually a couple of years ago, we had to go into dispatch business as well. It, it became simple necessity to consolidate those services and into one big supermarket. From my understanding, the lease situation comes only from one issue and one issue only. To make sure that drivers are earning the minimum wage. In our situation, drivers are earning well above minimum wage. So the lease 
maximum lease limit should increase drastically for this industry to flourish, to be able, for owners to be able to obtain newer car, new car, subsidize new technology, put cameras in the car for driver safety, which they are obligated on the current uh, regulation change. That is the goal, not to stay stagnant, keep on investing, investing in the industry, investing in technology, investing in people's income. We don't have employers in this industry. Everybody is self-employed. Everybody is the independent contractor. According to state legislature, if we are not providing the tools for operating the business, they cannot be our employee. Our organization are friends of the drivers. Our organization employs over 3,000 drivers. Very few of them complain, and if they complain, they complain mostly on operational day-to-day -day issues. Welcome back to The Spark, stories that change our times. We're speaking with three workers who are organizing for their rights in their industries. Let's start with you, Ron. What do you think about Alex Friedman's take on the taxi industry and his claim that drivers are doing well enough and should be charged more to drive? And for starters, Mr. Friedman seems to be confused about whether taxi drivers are employees or independent contractors. There are 5,000 taxi drivers um, that has to pay musical chairs on 1,600 taxi cabs. And it, um, so the drivers are always fighting to, um, to get work. And, and the cruel injustice with this system is the drivers start in a steep negative. So they owe like $80 a day for the taxi cab, $50 a day for the gasoline. They have to pay for the maintenance of the vehicles. 80% of the vehicles on the streets are actually owned by the taxi drivers themselves. So, and then um, the, the taxi regulators is responsible of setting up a, a maximum that they can charge either a, a minimum wage, but because we're not commission employees anymore, uh, they set a maximum rent, rental rate. And because there's more drivers than there are, are of actual taxi cab medallions, uh, these taxi owners are overcharging. So not only are the drivers starting in at a steep negative, they're also starting, um, they're paying more than they're supposed to pay. And according to the U.S. Department of uh, uh, Labor, the taxi drivers are listed into the, one of the top 10 dangerous occupations. So they're driving, doing one of the dangerous jobs, um, they're starting in a steep negative, and they're barely coming home with, 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 uh, with any pay. According to the parking, parking authority's own report, taxi drivers in Philadelphia are making like $4.37 an hour, you know? And, they, and, and they're working like 12 to 16 hours per day, six to seven days per week, you know? So there's really no family life. It's just basically all work, you know, and coming home and sleeping, you know? So it's, it's really, um, for, for someone to sit there and say that uh, he's doing great, uh, the, the taxi drivers are doing great, it, it's, it's beyond the driver's wildest imagination to be able to own one of these medallions. For Mamadou and Crystal, how does this relate to the ways workers in fast food and day labor are exploited by employers? Was there a particular moment in your life when you decided to fight against labor exploitation? Yes, there was uh, when, when the money was missing, about $6,000 and no one at the meeting decided to say anything about it um, when they told us they had to take money out of our tip money. And I was the only one that spoke up and said, this is not right, should call the cops. And first of all, there should be cameras at the office, in the office, um, facing at the office, in the office, and also there should be a safe. We, um, the way they do things there is they put money through a mail slot at the door. And supposedly there was about this much money missing. The door is this small. Mm -hmm. So how, how is it anybody going to be able to take money or an employee if the door is this small but this much of money in a sandwich bag at that mm -hmm. is missing? So um, they told us uh, the reason why that they didn't want to tell the police officers because that's too much money. Um, nobody has time for that. And she asked a couple of co uh, co-workers, uh, do you think it's best to call detectives and everything? They said uh, quiet. They just did quiet. Mm -hmm. um, I got highly upset. 
and I know that's not right, and I know it's an inside job, and as soon as she said they didn't take it out of our tip money, which is um, our money that we depend on uh, until we get our check, mm -hmm. um, that kind of really, you know, upset at me, because no employee should be treated like that. Mm -hmm. We are the ones that help them make the money, mm -hmm. so why not treat us right? Don't, why are they treating us as like straight animals in the street and just throw us a bone and we should be happy for the rest of the day. I can actually finally speak what I have to say and people can hear me. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm glad I'm here. Thank you, Crystal. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mamadou, can you tell us more about wage theft and day labor and experiences when you haven't been paid for work that you've done? Comme souvent, quand tu viens à Omdi pour le matin, il y a des travailleurs, il y a des patrons qui viennent Et dans les idées, nous ne venons, nous ne venons pas des États-Unis. Nous venons d'autres États, euh, autres pays. Donc maintenant, ils veulent prendre avantage sur toi. Quand ils comprennent ton anglais, ils voient que ton anglais n'est pas bon. Ils te disent que tu n'es pas, pas américain. Donc euh, ils te disent, OK, je t'embauche et je te donne ce que je veux. Quand tu dis non, ils s'en vont. Souvent, quand tu dis oui, il t'embauche. S'il doit te donner minimum 50 dollars, il ne te donne pas 50 dollars, il te donne 30 dollars. Parce qu'il dit que tu ne viens pas de ce pays. Donc, on, a des, on a des clients comme ça. Il y en a aussi, bon, ils n'ont pas de respect pour nous. Il y en a qui s'en foutent de nous. Il y en a aussi, bon, je ne sais pas comment expliquer ça, mais tu travailles toute la semaine. Quand la semaine finit, il te dit qu'il n'a pas l'argent. Quand tu appelles la police, la police vient, ils disent que eh, la police te... Toi, tu appelles la police, quand la police vient, la police ne te, t'écoute pas. La police te dit d'aller chercher eh, eh, un témoin ou bien d'aller chercher quelque part où tu peux trouver ton argent. We know that the attack on workers today extends beyond the cab industry, fast food and day labor. So now we want to hear from Lisa Hogan, the wife of a firefighter, who talks about the eroding American dream and begs the question, what are the opportunities to build and wield the power of the working class at a time when more and more people, including traditionally middle class workers like firefighters, teachers and nurses, are facing economic instability? The majority of firemen, I would say, work two jobs. I know very few that don't. Um, even when they get older and their children have moved out, they're still working two jobs. So, um, yeah, we see him less. Um, I sometimes feel like I'm a single, single parent. I think it's not just firemen, really. It's about workers in general in this country. Where we live in a country where wages are not just stagnating, they're falling for the average American. Where our bills are becoming more and more expensive. The cost of living is, is rising. The cost of gas has gone up. Your utilities have gone up. Um, and it's really squeezing people to where people, it's like you're learning how to swim and you're trying to keep your head above and you're paddling and you're paddling, but you can feel the water. You can feel it. You can feel it coming. Um, and you know eventually you're going to go down. And I think that for the vast majority of Americans to work so hard and to give so much of their time, so much of their family time, so much of their talent to a job and to be so underappreciated is just wrong. It doesn't matter if you're a fireman, if you're a teacher, if you're a trash collector, if you work at McDonald's. It doesn't matter. You should be valued and you should make a living that you can live on. It's outrageous, really, what's happening to people and what's happening to the middle class of this country. It's one of the reasons why I always say to people, unions are so important. They're not perfect, but they're important. And that they're important because they protect you. They protect you against the big you know, corporation that does not care if you can pay your bills. They do not care if you can take your children to the doctor. They do not care if you can put shoes on your children's feet or food in their mouth. Um, and I think that history shows that. As we reflect on Captain Goodwin's life, it is clear that his deeds, his service, and his great work as a Philadelphia firefighter 
have led him to eternal peace. It is now our job to comfort and to heal each other and to strive to be as good of heart as Captain Goodwin was. Let his legacy be a guiding force in our lives, for that is the best way to honor his sacrifice. You know, I, I've written a eulogy. I've planned his funeral. I've done these things because this city has no regard for his life or for the lives of the people he works with. And... That's terrifying. I think they deserve better. I think we deserve better. I don't want to sit my kids down one day and say, Daddy's never coming home from work. Be proud of your father because he sacrificed his life in service to the city. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't, I don't want that to be his legacy. I always say to people, when you feel hopeless, that's the time to do something because through action, is, comes hope. That's where you get your hope. When you go out and you do something to make a change, that's when you feel, you know what, this is possible. And people in this city really, they really do care and they really do um, have respect and regard for these people, for the brave men and women that do this job. It's just the leaders have lost sight of that. The leaders in this city have lost sight of what their citizens want. Either they've lost sight of it or they just don't care. Welcome back to The Spark, stories that change our times. I think what Lisa Hogan points out is that workers in both the private and public sectors, whether they're unionized or not, are under attack in different ways and beyond the workday. Our schools, fire stations, libraries, and hospitals are being closed or privatized. Basically, our very right to thrive is being threatened. So my final question to you all is once you've won what you're fighting for in your workplace, where does the struggle go from there? What are your visions, your broader visions for a just world? Crystal? Um, <clears throat> be more peaceful, less violence going on. Um, there's people that even work in fast food places or any other kind of job. They're out there stealing, killing people for money to survive. If we were to win, we would be it would be actually so much better. The world would be so much peaceful. And yeah, that's all I have right now. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Crystal. You're welcome. Yes. Um, besides like our immediate taxi struggle, like we do want better uh, schools for our children, better housing, affordable housing for everyone. Um, everyone to have health care, decent health care. Uh, the environment that we all are conscious you're consciously taking part of preserving the environment to pass it on to other generations and that um, we as workers um, stop allowing them to isolate us you know like whenever it's, it's someone's turning a barrel they demonize that particular group of workers and then they move on to, to the next issue so we as workers have got to start working together seeing each other seeing each other as workers you know and, um, and hopefully um, the, the, the bosses, uh, they come around as well and we can have a more just world. For me, I want to find the good solution because it can't continue like that. Since when I came to Philadelphia, it's the same problem. Because uh, my friends, some of my friends are going to another state to go to work. Mais moi, je ne vais pas aller en autre temps. Moi, je vais rester ici. Et on va chercher aussi, aussi la meilleure solution, comment on peut, on va chercher la meilleure solution, comment on peut résoudre ce problème. Pour moi, ce problème-là, ce n'est pas, pas trop, ce pas difficile. On peut résoudre ça n'importe quand. Oui. Um, what, what do you all have to say to your fellow workers about how we get to a just world? What, what do we need to say to them to get everybody together working for justice and peace, as Crystal said? Um, if we stand together, we can be able to win this. Um, it's like um, the one person that comes to my mind is uh, Martin Luther King. He, he didn't risk his life for nothing. As you know, he fought for his people and he fought, he didn't matter what the risk was. So that's how it should be. You know, you stand for what's right. And it doesn't matter what the risk is because at the end it's going to be so worth it. You know, it's um, like um, one of Martin Luther King said is, if you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. Mm -hmm.
doesn't matter. Just get there. Keep moving forward. That's how it should be. Awesome. Ron. That's great. Yeah. Um, so I, I, w I would like for my fellow workers to know it's not you. You're not the problem. Don't feel like um, I'm working hard every day. I'm doing everything I can. I just got to keep working harder. I must be doing something wrong. It's not you. It's the system. We're all under attack. And we just got to come together. We got to realize that. We, um, when we see another group of workers being attacked, we got to understand what's going on. We got to understand that the machine has switched focus and that I can be next. So we, one by one, we come together, we can change things. Okay. So all of that was really powerful, and I think the, the, you know, the most important message is that we have to keep working hard, keep working together, keep loving each other, um, and not to be afraid. I, I really, we all really appreciate you all's leadership in the struggle, and are so glad that you could join us today. Thank you for watching The Spark, Stories That Change Our Times, produced by MMPTV. For more stories about everyday people who are leading the way to winning our human rights, visit us online at thespark.tv. I'm Wendy Marshall. Have a good night.